I'm Terrence Das, and the post-budget show on TV One starts in just a bit. Don't move a muscle. Welcome to the post-budget show on TV One, where we analyze the budget that was tabled last Friday, and we try to bring you the salient points that we think matter most to Malaysians. Uh, let's start off with a couple of uh, graphic figures, which most Malaysians know by heart by now, having looked at various aspects of the budget. This stands out. The number, the figure that's uh, encompassing the greater expenditure of the government for 2016, 267.2 billion. Now what this means is that there is a 3.1 deficit staring at uh, the budget. But this is a, a deficit that has been shrinking year on year. And a shrinking deficit is definitely something that will all go well for the country, uh, given that when ratings agencies look at this shrinking deficit, they're bound to perhaps give us a favorable rating. This will in turn look, look good for our uh, foreign exchange, and that means a stronger ringgit in the year to come. Let's move on. The next figure that we're trying to get you to look at, ladies and gentlemen at home, and I hope you can see this clearly, is the M40 figure. For the very first time, the budget targets specific uh, tax breaks and reliefs for this group that have, uh, well, in previous budgets felt a little left out. But in this budget, there's a specific mention of just how much is going to be going into tax breaks and reliefs for the M40, the middle income, the group that has felt uh, left out in previous budgets. And they earn basically between 3,860 ringgit a month to a ceiling of 8,320 ringgit a month. Let's move on to the next figure. In today's discussion, we're also going to be looking at uh, some intense growth for Sabah and Sarawak. Now, we know about the Pan-Borneo Highway, which uh, is mentioned in the 11th Malaysia Plan, and development will continue way into 2021. For now, though, there are many intensified development projects that are aimed at these two states, uh, which are definitely a little left behind in terms of growth and development as we speak. But with these new projects in place and the infrastructure uh, focused on Sabah and Sarawak, there will be more development in the year to come. Moving forward, let's take a look at the next graphic. Uh, and this figure is also something that we are hoping to discuss with our guests in the studio. Minimum wage, which hopes to increase disposable income across the board. Moving forward. And this is our final uh, slide that we have for you before we start the show proper with my guests in the studio. Uh, there has been some confusion as to why so many agencies exist in the first place to deliver the same thing, which is basically affordable housing. Uh, why these many agencies exist and to what their roles are in dispersing these many development projects which are focused on helping the rakyat own their first home. We will be having a special call-out segment on this very issue. So stay with us for the discussion. And it's not just going to be me and my polka dot tie speaking to you for the next hour. I have two very uh, learned guests in the studio, so let's join them right now and take this discussion to the next level. I'd like to thank, of course, uh, my two guests at this point uh, in time, Dr. Wira Jalilababa. Thank you for joining us. You. Uh, she's the president of the Malaysian Inter International Chamber of Commerce and Industry, MICCI. Thank you for being here, Dato. And we also have Tuan Haji Abdulaziz Sabubaka, who is the president of the Malaysian Association of Tax Accountants. Thank you, sir, for being here. Thank you. Uh, we'll start off basically with you, Dato. Uh, an overview of the global economy, if you would, and uh, this vis-a-vis -vis the Malaysian picture. Thank you, Ray. Now, uh, basically, I think we are all aware that uh, whatever happened in our economy, in Malaysia especially, uh, will have uh, e effect on what is happening in the global economy. So global economy is not very uh, stable now, right now, especially what matters, the countries that matters to us would be those that we do trading and we do deal with. Uh, for example, China. Yeah? Uh, China's economy has been... Uh, reduce in terms of its growth mm -hmm. and uh, there has been also refocus on uh, its economy 
from the previous uh, development economy now they are also going into consumption economy and from property they are now uh, they are concentrating more on property development before but now they are looking at consumption economy which will support their economy mm -hmm. consumption economy in in a way is good for us because hopefully it will increase the demand but because uh, their their gdp growth has been reduced so therefore the uh, purchasing power from there has seen a reduction. Mm -hmm. So this is quite a concern to Malaysia and it has affected our export in that sense. Mm -hmm. Although China is still our largest trading partner, but in terms of total export to China has been reducing. So we have to do something about it, maybe refocus on our export products and see what's the demand trend like. Mm -hmm. The same with the US and Europe. Mm -hmm. US and Europe, uh, US is doing pretty well, mm -hmm. but Europe is not doing that well. Mm -hmm. So this uh, will affect our, our export as well because electronic products which are being produced here and electronic is the largest export for Malaysia and the buyers are all in US and Europe. So if they are buying less, we are affected. Uh, there was a scare in September about the increase of interest rates for the US markets uh, and this did not happen. Yeah, unfortunately. Uh, it, it doesn't look like it's going to happen in this year. That's true. Uh, they, they look to be staving off the increase in interest rates. Uh, but what of next year? Will, will the trend continue? Will they uh, reserve increasing interest rates? There has been some argument there. Actually, ECB were questioned why not now, you know, what I, why it, this is told, you know. I think uh, the time will come that eventually it will be increased because if they do increase the interest rate, then all the money will run there. And that is what we are worried about, mm -hmm. you know, because then it will attract investment to that area, to Europe rather than here. The hot yeah. money flowing so, yeah. in a different direction. Um, Let's look at tax for, an, uh, for a moment and uh, before we, we focus back on the Malaysian budget, the Malaysian tax system has collected uh, and become the saviour of sorts of the budget thanks to the GST. Yeah. Uh, but before we get into the GST, Tuanji, I want to focus on the M40, yeah. which is a group that uh, has been left out by previous budgets. They felt a little left out. Uh, they are those that earn between about 3,800 ringgit to about 8,300 ringgit. Yeah. Uh, these are group the group of individuals that are paying tax and they form something like one million odd Malaysians who are tax paying Malaysians and uh, they, they felt that they shoulder a lot of burden in terms of development and uh, their fellow Malaysians. Uh, so for this specific budget there is a mention for this group and many tax breaks have been given. Yeah. How do you see the, these tax breaks helping the M40 and, and why increase their disposable income? All right. Um, uh, it, it is true, uh, uh, based on the previous budget or, or the budget previously, uh, uh, the M40 group uh, has been uh, uh, being, they, they, are, they, are felt, they feel that it, they are being left out. And uh, it is good that, that this year's budget, the 2016 budget, uh, the government has uh, looked into this issue and uh, uh, special relief or relief uh, has been given. Uh, relief has not been uh, uh, revised since way so many years back. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is good that uh, when, this, uh, when, have, when, when in the 2016 budget, uh, increase the relief and it will help in terms of uh, increasing the, the, the disposable income uh, of the, the mid-40. The mid and uh, if you can go through some of the relief that uh, it is in the budget, uh, the spouse relief uh, from uh, 3,000 to 4,000, uh, children relief uh, from below, uh, below 18 years old from 1,000 to 2,000 dollars, uh, children studying at territory level from 6,000 to 8,000. There are a lot of relief in terms of, uh, and, and we have been, uh, the association have been asking, uh, requesting in our proposal, our budget uh, consultation uh, to increase the relief to help the taxpayer, especially the mid-40, the middle income group, uh, to, for them to increase the disposable income. So it is good that mm -hmm. uh, the, this year, the 2016 budget, uh, the government has addressed this issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, when we look at uh, the Malaysian economy and uh, the, the shrinking of the ringgit, the fall in petrol prices, uh, these are all quite worrying trends. But the budget has made mention that 2016 will be the year of innovation. And there's a lot of drive, uh, the year of commercialization, sorry. And there's a lot of drive for innovation in this budget. Uh, what are your thoughts on innovation being a catalyst for growth? And uh, how, how can innovation actually take the driver's seat in the year 2016? 
I think there's no doubt uh, that uh, innovation and uh, research and development and productivity will be the main catalyst for the development of Malaysian economy. And, uh, and I, I see the reason why the Prime Minister announced a special budget increase to Agency Innovasi Malaysia, for example, AIM, and uh, also given to the uh, other agencies uh, that will be involved in research and development. So I think this augurs well with the trend whereby actually for years, Malaysian government has been uh, trying to push for uh, SMEs and Malaysian companies to go into research and developments and innovations and so on. Mm -hmm. So Agency Innovasi Malaysia is where they will look at innovations done by either Malaysian companies or foreign companies and they take up equity there mm -hmm. for good projects. Mm -hmm. So with their injection of capital, the, those innovations could also prosper and become bigger and could be commercialized at a higher level. So this is something which I feel very encouraged about, mm -hmm. actually, because it's not easy to push companies to go for R&D development and innovation and so on. Although there has been a lot of budget being given, grants being given to, for R&D, but still the level has not achieved the targets that we wanted it to be. Mm. You know? As we speak, there are many patents that sit on the shelves yeah. in many of our True. institutional True. Uh, educations of higher yeah. institution. Uh, what are your thoughts on these patents? They sit there, they take up funds because to maintain these patents, there has to be an allocation of budget. Uh, for those patents. Why have these patents not seen the light of day? Why haven't they been taken to market? Well, previously those universities, they, I'm sorry to say that they did their research and innovations not based on the demand of the market. And probably last time, yeah, last time it was just to, to qualify for their PhDs probably. Mm -hmm. But now there is a, a different trend whereby the uh, the universities are encouraged to do to take up research and development and innovations based on the market requirement that was why uh, there is a high encouragement into going into innovation work together with the industries so uh, academia and industry collaboration is highly encouraged so therefore whatever is being produced or innovated in the universities could be commercialized meaning the companies are already waiting for those kind of innovation or could also be worked together with private sector. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So like that, then only it will not end up in the shelf. You know? uh, well, let's look forward. Can I, can I, yes, uh, please, yeah. please, Swanji. Uh, innovations, productivity and creativity, mm -hmm. those, those are very important things. See, when we want to move into a developed nation, a high-income, developed, advanced economy, uh, it, it, it requires uh, innovative uh, um, uh, issues in other matters, uh, creativity and productivity. So, uh, you see, uh, the, the only way to increase the economy in terms of being an advanced economy is through uh, innovations. Mm. So that is why I think in this, this budget, the 2016 budget, uh, uh, it has to ensure that, that R&D being done at the university level uh, can be commercialised. And uh, is, is you turn the idea into wealth creation, and it will help in terms of uh, boosting the economy. Mm -hmm. being to, to become but innovation is not only on products, you must remember. It's also in Process. enhancing services and yeah, processes. Delivery. For example, I'm also the chairman of uh, CALS, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Centre for Logistic Studies. This is a study and innovation in terms of how do we enhance Malaysia to be the total logistic uh, uh, centre in ASEAN, for example. Mm -hmm. So we can't just let Singapore forever being the total logistic centre. Malaysia slowly is coming down, but what do we need to do? So this is what CALS do under PKT Logistics Group. Mm -hmm. This is what we do. We work together with various universities to enhance Malaysia's position in attracting all these logistic providers and the components to logistics to use Malaysia as the centre for ASEAN. You, know? you mentioned wealth, Wanaji, and I yeah. think uh, uh, you know what's coming. It's the super tax, yeah. the tax bracket <laughs> that we thought would never be created. 25% to 28% yes. if your uh, taxable income for the year is above 1 million ringgit. Right. Uh, this is for a special bracket of individuals, yeah. uh, which uh, are definitely, uh, previously they were only paying 25% at, yeah. at the maximum tax level. What's your opinion of this new super tax? Yeah, uh, 
it, it's funny. <laughs> it, it's quite funny <laughs> because uh, uh, looking at looking at uh, the neighboring countries or, or countries all over the world, uh, uh, yeah, what they are reducing, mm -hmm. they are reducing the individual tax, and uh, by having GST as an indirect tax, it will increase the 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 the, 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 in, the direct indirect tax in terms of consumption. Right. That that was that was the main objective. When you introduce GST, you reduce the the, the individual tax, the, the the income tax. But uh, it is a bit funny in terms of uh, uh, taxing the super rich at the moment. But again, uh, there were some issues when when 2015 budget was presented. Uh, in 20, uh, 2015 budget was presented. Uh, uh, many have said that uh, we are taxing the poor uh, when when we introduce GST. But uh, when this year, when we, when we tax the super rich, uh, there are also issues. But uh, I think uh, what the government is doing is actually in, in balancing, balancing the need and, and taxing the super rich. Uh, uh, previously, uh, we have excess profit tax, meaning what we do is actually the government, uh, they tax the companies which are making huge profits. Mm -hmm. And uh, looking at the, the, in terms of the income, uh, by the companies in terms of tax revenue, uh, it's about seventy, about seventy-eight billion by mm -hmm. the corporate corporate tax, and in, individually it's about thirty-eight billion. Uh, uh, I think per personally, I feel that uh, a more, if it is getting additional revenue, tax revenue from the from the tax point of view, from the income tax, uh, it should have been the company rather than individual. Rather than Actually, the individual. there I'm a bit disappointed mm -hmm. that the corporate tax has not been reduced at all. Because if you look at the competitiveness of Malaysia vis-a-vis -vis all the countries around us, Singapore corporate tax is much lower, yes. Hong Kong is much lower. Mm -hmm. So every year we have been trying to reduce uh, corporate tax, but it didn't work so far. Yeah. Right. Uh, when we come back, we'll take off uh, where we have left this discussion on the tax issue. Uh, of that new bracket being created and we will also be speaking to a special guest on call out addressing affordable housing. Don't go anywhere, we'll be right back with more post-budget analysis for 2016. Welcome back to the show and thank you for joining us. If you just tuned in, we are discussing the budget that was tabled last Friday and we're looking forward to 2016 to see what lies ahead for Malaysia. Uh, now, when we left uh, the discussion at the table with my two guests, we were addressing the super tax, a tax that's been targeted at individuals who are earning, uh, well, w way above uh, most of us here in Malaysia. They are the super rich and uh, their personal tax uh, or taxable income, uh, which qualifies them for this last bracket of 28%, would be 1 million ringgit a year. So that's a whopping sum. Um, Tuan Haji, let, yeah. let me come back to you and ask you this uh, quick question uh, to think about tax uh, before we get your answer on it. Um, the super rich, they have mobility, they're financially free, yeah. they're able to move yes. from one country True. to the next. Yeah. So in imposing this sort of tax, are we not giving them that incentive to move? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, alternatively, what they can do is set up companies. So, you see, uh, a, a company tax rate is about 24%. Mm -hmm. It is 24% next year in 2016. So, if, if I'm in that bracket, which I'm not, <laughs> but uh, in, terms of, in terms of income, in terms of chargeable income, uh, I will set up a company and I only pay 24% in terms of uh, corporate tax rather than an individual tax, which is about 28%. Mm. So I, if, I, I'll save 4% mm -hmm. there. If they do that, it is okay because they are here in Malaysia. Mm -hmm. But the issue is if they, they, you know, they, they, they are mobile in terms of mobility and uh, they might take their business or in terms of their services elsewhere. Uh, uh, like um, Dr. was saying, in terms of uh, Singapore, in terms of our neighboring countries, uh, they are, it is more competitive in terms of uh, the, the, the tax rate. And uh, we are afraid that uh, they might do that. Mm -hmm. So by doing that, we are losing Rather than we are gaining in terms of the, the super rich, we are taxing the super rich in terms of trying to get from these people, uh, but they are moving out. Uh, and uh, these, these measures, uh, this proposal, uh, has to be scrutinized uh, uh, in terms of, uh, in term by the government. Yeah. Thank you, Tohanji. Yeah. On the other end of the divide are individuals looking to purchase their first home. And they're struggling because of various reasons. Uh, and most of these individuals are located in city centers, uh, still trying their level best to own their first home, even with a combined household income of 5000 to uh, 10000 a month, can be challenging 
if you're trying to purchase a property in Kuala Lumpur, for instance. So addressing this problem, the budget has made special allocations across the board, across the various agencies uh, like Prima, uh, but helping us make sense of all these agencies and what they are designed to do is my guest on call out right now. That's a Dr. Uh, Kamarul Rashdan Haji Saleh, who's the president of uh, the Professional and Entrepreneurs Club, MYPEC. Uh, thank you, Dato, for joining us on the line. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me into this program. Uh, Dato, first and foremost, can we clarify what the various roles of these agencies will be in setting up affordable housing? Well, uh, Prime Minister had mentioned there are a few agencies involved uh, in providing affordable homes. Like Prima, for example, you know, we are focusing more on uh, the middle income group, you know, young professionals, young families. Whereas for the public uh, civil servant home scheme, PPA 1M, mm -hmm. focusing for uh, the civil servant um, and, and also the middle income group, but working uh, across the country in this uh, civil department. And then for uh, Ruma Masrayat, uh, it's focusing for the low to low medium income group. Um, and then the rest the KPKT under the PPRT program, also focusing on the low to low middle income group. Mm -hmm. So uh, different agencies have a different set of priorities. Uh, they aim, of course, to fulfill the needs for affordable homes. Uh, that's a, there, there's a 1.6 billion ringgit budget to be spent building 175,000 houses. Uh, these houses, are they carried forward from the previous budget or are they new units allocated under this budget for 2016? As far as I'm concerned, this is part of the government promise under, the, under their manifesto to complete a 1 million uh, unit of affordable homes throughout the country. And this has been um, um, but, uh, op I mean, divided in, uh, into various agencies, including Prima. And what we know here is that Prima will deliver about 500,000 units of uh, affordable homes mm -hmm. out of that 1 million. And in this case, uh, that budget, I mean, for this year, uh, 1.6 billion, uh, which uh, will deliver about 175,000 units of affordable homes, uh, is part of the uh, 500,000 units as promised by Prima. Uh, when it comes to affordable homes, uh, the location is uh, something that's also been discussed in Kuala Lumpur, the city centres, uh, land banks are the issue. Just where does the government plan under these various agencies to set up these new projects? I think this will be the big challenge. Um, no doubt uh, there is a frustration among the um, middle income group, uh, first time buyers that you know, they cannot buy uh, a good house, a good quality house, you know, affordable price uh, within the city centre. And the reason behind it is because um, it's, it's hard, you know. I must admit that uh, based upon the feedback I see from these agencies, uh, most of them uh, felt that uh, it's, it's very, very hard to find a piece of land, uh, which, um, you know, when they bought it, then they can offer affordable uh, price uh, for the uh, for the first-time buyer, for example, this is due to the fact that the gross uh, development cost is uh, slightly higher than the gross development value. And in fact, uh, I don't think so. The government will be heavily subsidised, uh, you know, to, to to many of these uh, houses uh, uh, offered in, in the market. Um, and it is not a wise thing to do so, due to the fact that uh, for the affordable homes, uh, we have the targeted uh, people. Uh, it will not be uh, sold to any, you know, higher income group or not within the income bracket. So the challenge is always uh, the land cost, uh, uh, which is uh, slightly above uh, the, the the budget that uh, you know they, they have set up in order to provide these affordable homes. Right. So uh, what I can see here is that uh, another way of um, resolving this issue will be the government to uh, develop uh, the uh, mid rural area, you know, for example, uh, right now, uh, government focusing uh, to develop these uh, affordable homes, you know, somewhere in Rawang, you know, or in Klang, or, or even in Sungai Bulo, you know, as, as part and parcel to, to pro uh, keep up their promise uh, for the people. And I hope uh, this will be able uh, for them to offer the affordable homes at the price below than 500,000 ringgit. 
Thank you, Dr. Doctor, for joining us on Call Out. Uh, of course, these mid-rural areas will be made more accessible uh, with better connectivity through public transport. Um, let's just touch a little bit on uh, housing uh, before we proceed. Uh, in the budget, there's also an allocation for basically guaranteeing uh, the deposits of uh, individuals seeking to purchase their first home, helping them with their loans, etc. The risk of default among uh, individuals who are in the B40 group uh, is, uh, is high. Uh, for some banks, they would report saying that uh, almost all loans given to individuals in the B40 group uh, have defaulted at some point in time or, or other. So this risk, who's going to bear the risk? Is it all going to be shouldered by the government? Uh, Datuk, perhaps you, you would like <laughs> to take this one. Well, um, basically I have been... Uh checking in with uh, several banks because I used to sit in one of the banks board. The uh, non-payment is actually not that high, actually. You know, the defaulters are not that high because somehow the banks would have consultation sessions where they would come in and help and monitor because every stage of payments is being monitored. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. So it's about 2.4% defaults normally. Mm -hmm. you know? so this I, is across the board for across all Across the board, yeah, for all kinds of loans through the banks, right. you know. So the but uh, for businesses, of course, there is CGC Credit Guarantee Corporations. Mm -hmm. But for individuals, of course, before they even approve, they would have seen whether you have capability to pay. That will reduce the risk. Of mm -hmm. course, there are defaulters. Then, of course, there are measures that they, they could uh, resort to, like declaring bankrupt. Mm -hmm. or what do you think? Yeah. yeah? No. Um, look. Look at it at a different angle. Uh, rather than uh, issue the issues of them not paying, uh, help them in terms of increasing their B40 income. Uh, give them training, give them knowledge, give them skill, mm. uh, uh, assist them to increase their income so that they don't default mm -hmm. in terms of payment. Because, uh, okay, you, you, are, you are assisting them in terms of financial and all those things, affordable homes, but at the same time, uh, help them for the, uh, the, the, the income yeah, side. That's why yeah, that's I said. They would have been uh, some programs to handhold them yeah. before they even get the approval, you know, mm -hmm. to ensure that they would have the capability to pay. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, the banks will suffer. You know? <laughs> that, is, that is a concern yeah. as well. But yeah. uh, moving forward, uh, the basic uh, rule of thumb here is that we want to get as many Malaysians to be yeah. house owners, yeah. to be homeowners. Uh, and that has been a challenge uh, because of a uh, certain group of individuals who are in the B40 yeah. uh, unable to qualify for loans for some yeah. reason or the other. And that's why these schemes are in place. Yeah. Uh, well, moving forward, we're going to look at some of those measures which yeah. are being put in place to help businesses and not just uh, the multinationals. Yeah. We're also focusing here the on the SMEs, SMEs yeah. of the small industries in, in the rural villages. These are also receiving a hefty proportion of the budget in terms of allocation. So we spoke to the Deputy Minister of Finance and this is what he had to say. The incentive or the programs announced in Budget 2016 encompass either uh, low interest loans or subsidised interest and include incentive in terms of tax measures and also grant to assist in terms of export. Approximately $2 billion is being provided in this Budget 2016 with all various range and various uh, activity. The government has also provided various tax incentives. A 50,000 tax deduction is provided in 2016 budget. This is to help and to drive more SME to develop and to do more research to increase their competitiveness. The government has also reactivated the reinvestment allowance that has expired. This is to encourage existing companies that have already invested to continue to invest in Malaysia so that they are entitled to this reinvestment allowance. 235 million uh, development or assistance fund to METI or MATRID to encourage them to develop more SME to export. SMEs are uh, backbone of the economy of the countries, consists of 98.5% of the total establishment of the company in Malaysia. We hope that the government uh, can seriously really implement down the earth to help the SME to go international uh, to improve the SME competitiveness and the upskilling. Well, we have uh, two well, heavyweights of finance there weighing in on the budget and what it means for, for the future of Malaysia. 
Uh, and the future of Malaysian business, especially the SMEs, look to be in good hands with uh, a number of loans and schemes being allocated for the SMEs. How important is it uh, to, to drive uh, SME development? Definitely, as uh, we know, SME is the backbone of all industries. And if you look at the scenario of investment, why do you think multinational companies, foreign companies invest in Malaysia? Because we have a complete supply chain here. Supply chain are all provided by SMEs in Malaysia and they are the ones that become vendors and suppliers to every needs of the foreign investors here. You mm -hmm. know, they can't just come and without support. Mm -hmm. And the very existence of SMEs support the FDIs to come in. And when FDI comes in, it prosper those SMEs as well. But definitely SMEs got to be prepped to be assisted through various programs and incentives and which has been announced by the government, which I'm happy that there has been quite a lot of support facilities available for SMEs. Yeah. Let's now talk about the saviour of the budget. Many herald GST as being uh, the instrument that saved the budget, basically. Yeah. Uh, the fall in petrol prices, the low ringgit. Uh, this did not all go well for the projection of uh, good returns for the government in 2016. But GST uh, came in at a very timely moment yeah. in, in uh, the country's uh, history. Uh, Tuhanji, where do you see uh, GST moving forward? There are many items that have been zero rated, yeah. uh, new announcements for even food items and some medicines which yeah. have been called for by the med medical professionals. Uh, professionals. Uh, so where do you see GST moving forward in 2016-20? Okay, uh, uh, it is actually just in time. Mm -hmm. uh, when, when we introduced GST in April 2015, uh, it, it was a good move. It is a good move. Uh, and uh, if we had not introduced uh, GST, uh, our deficit is about 4.8%. So now when we introduce GST, our, the revised, even the rate, the deficit uh, rate of deficit has been revised to about 3.2% and next year 3.1%. Uh, if you look at uh, in terms of uh, SST, mm -hmm. in terms of the revenue, uh, revenue that SST, the sales and service tax brings in, uh, it is about 18 million a year. Uh, under GST, it is about 36 to 39 billion. So, it, because, and uh, if you look at the numbers of registrant, under SST, it's only 63,000. Yep. It is only 63,000 uh, files, I mean, registrant. But it is under, under, under the GST, uh, they are about nearly to 400,000. Hmm. So, that is the issue of broadening the, the widen the gap, the tax, the tax uh, broaden the base in terms of uh, uh, widening the base. And, it gives the, 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 the country, uh, in terms of uh, uh, constant income, more stable income, income in terms of consumption. And, uh, 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 and uh, personally, uh, I've been with, uh, you know, advocating the GST <laughs> for a long time. And uh, Alhamdulillah, it is a good move. It was a good move by the government. And uh, in future, uh, for developed countries, uh, the, in terms of... Uh, the ratio, direct tax and indirect tax, uh, it is uh, uh, quite similar in terms of 50-50. Mm. And now, uh, in terms of the tax revenue, the direct tax revenue, I think it is about 70% against 30% of indirect tax. So we should uh, broaden the base and increase the GST uh, revenue mm -hmm. and uh, reduce uh, the direct tax in terms of income tax. And moving in, forward. In that yeah. sense, GST is a more efficient way of tax collection mm -hmm. for the country and there's no leakages mm -hmm. uh, compared to SST. Yeah. Uh, SST, yeah. previously, there were a lot of leakages and the revenue did not come to the government. Mm. Yeah. Uh, there's still this prevalent argument that GST is a burden on the people. Your, your perception, Tuanji? Mm -hmm. uh, it's a burden that we share <laughs> uh, as a Malaysian. Mm -hmm. uh, you see, uh, if you look at the income tax, uh, only uh, there, there were issues uh, previously, uh, 13, about 20, 30 million population, mm -hmm. 12 million working group, about 3, 4 million only paying, paying tax. tax right. Meaning this group of people is, you know, is helping the, the, the rest of the population mm -hmm. in terms of uh, uh, infrastructure. Yeah, and all mm -hmm. like that. It is in balance. Mm -hmm. So what we, are, what we are moving for developed countries, uh, it is actually widening or broadening the tax base. Mm -hmm. So that every one of us, each and every one of us, uh, share in terms of contributing to the nation. To mm -hmm. contribute. Uh, let's revisit an old idea, an idea put forward by uh, the opposition to charge more GST for luxury items. Is it feasible, Kwanji? Uh, as it is, um, GST, our mechanism now is, is quite complicated enough. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I don't think, it, you know, by doing that, it will only complicate matters. Uh, if you look at in Singapore, uh, 
uh, most of I mean, all the products, all the goods and services are, are standard same, rated. Yeah. They are standard rated. But uh, due to, uh, in Malaysia, we have so many exemptions, zero rated, relief, kind. and, and it, is, it is quite difficult for the, not e even the, the business community in terms of, uh, you know, preparing the system. And then when this zero rated uh, group of, uh, in this, this, this budget, the 2016 budget, more products are being zero rated. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the, the business community, they have to uh, adjust their, their process, the system, the accounting system, and it, it gives a lot of complication. And plus, how yeah. do you define luxury, luxury items? items. To me, maybe 2,000 is luxury, but to higher income group, maybe 2,000 is nothing. So where do you draw the line? Mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. quite impossible. Yeah. Well, we've been weighing in on many issues about the budget. When we come back, we'll talk about minimum wage, Sabah and Sarawak, and some special allocations uh, for development in those two states. We'll be back in just a bit. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back to the analysis on the budget for 2016, which was tabled last Friday. Uh, moving forward, we're going to focus on minimum wage. Now, many have seen uh, this as being something that will cause a domino effect, a cascading effect on the price of all items in the economy. Uh, just by increasing one factor, uh, for instance, we are probably familiar with the days when the price of petrol was increased by just about 10 cents. This caused a cascading effect on an increase of every single item. Even your breakfast dish of roti canai uh, mm -hmm. saw an increase of 10 cents. Uh, unfair as this, this may seem, uh, this is the reality that we face. Will we face a similar situation now with the increase in wages? Uh, it is also uh, good to note that in Sabah and Sarawak, the wages have also been increased, uh, as is in Semenanjung where the new rates for minimum wage have already been announced. Don Haji, your opinion on this. Will yeah. this create a domino effect? It is again a balancing act. Because at the same time, uh, when, uh, the rakyat are, are complaining in terms of uh, the, when there's an increase in cost, uh, the cost of living, uh, it, it doesn't commensurate with the, the increase in income. So, uh, so, so which is which? Now, because when the government introduced in terms of the, the minimum wage, so it will help in terms of increasing the income of the people. Mm. And, but, this, but at the same time, uh, the employers, the, the MEF, for example, they are, they are complaining in terms of because it will, translate it. it will be translated into higher cost of doing business and it will be transferred back to even in terms of the cost of the product or, or the services. Mm. And uh, it is again, uh, so uh, personally, I, th I feel that uh, uh, it is good in terms of having a, a minimum wage of, of increasing it from 900 to 1000 and to 1200 dollars uh, and it will help the people uh, in terms of the companies the business community there, there are a lot of incentives uh, tax rate is mm -hmm. being reduced by 1% mm -hmm. in uh, 2016 yeah. so when you when when that means uh, there's a saving of 1% uh, in terms of income tax uh, I, I think it will offset against the, the, the minimum wage mm -hmm. issue. Uh, yeah. A layman question on Twitter, uh, Dato, about what minimum wage really means. If I'm earning 900 ringgit now, once the minimum wage is increased to 1,000, I will earn 1,000. So that means I, I have some yeah, uh, increase yeah. in disposable income. But what if I'm already earning 5,000 ringgit? Uh, will this increase affect me? No, minimum wage is go by category, right? Mm. Because it's, it doesn't affect the higher income group. Yeah. You know, this is, we are talking about the labour market, you know. And that is why if we don't move up the, the minimum wage, forever our labour, labourers or workforce and in that category will be earning low. And we will never move into higher income economy, mm -hmm, you know. Mm -hmm. And that is why the skilled workforce are working in Singapore, for example, it's just next door because they are paid higher there. So one way is to increase the income of the labourers so that they would come back, especially the skilled workforce. Yeah. You know? If you look at the per capita income in terms of uh, when we, where we are now and when we are, where we are heading in 2020, I, I have done some calculation. Uh, the salary, the income has to increase by about 6% per, mm -hmm. per, per, per year. Yeah. Per year. Then we'll achieve that 15,000 USD in 2020. Yeah. That is for the per capita income in general. But for the B40 group, uh, they are earning a household income of about 2,500. 
in the 11th measure plan, it is proposed that uh, by 2020, this group of people, their income, household income will increase, has to be increased to about 5,000. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And their percentage in terms of increase is about 15%. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so those are the rates that, that, that we are looking at. But, yeah. And, and, and we, are, we should move towards that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, when we look at Sabah and Sarawak, uh, it's a completely different landscape. Uh, there's uh, mountainous terrains and it has been difficult to develop these two states. Uh, hence the budget proposal for uh, this uh, year in, moving forward, has been increased for Sabah and Sarawak specifically. There's also the Pan Borneo Highway, which is mm. going to be uh, something we'll see uh, replicated in many more budgets to come leading up to 2021. So that's one of the main key developments taking place in the state. The peripheral network of roads from the rural areas into the city areas, these are something of concern. Uh, how will we actually address all these developmental needs in Sabah and Sarawak and balance that uh, with, of course, the need for more income to continuously uh, maintain the development? That's I think the government has done well in terms of addressing the issues in Sabah and Sarawak. Because uh, the budget announced uh, upgrade in the highways, about $16 billion. And there are various others like the rumah panjang, the long houses, mm -hmm. and the air connectivity uh, sponsorships, and so on. So you, if you see the details, there's quite a lot being given or focused there. But mainly, one is to to upgrade the lives of those people uh, in Sarawak and Sabah. Second is also to upgrade the connectivity, meaning logistics. Mm -hmm. So if we want to be one Malaysia where the, there's a balanced development between Peninsular Malaysia and Sabah and Sarawak, yeah. where they have more land which are untouched and uh, the, the logistics services are not so high grade as compared to here because the quality of roads and connectivity are uh, almost non-existent in certain areas. Mm -hmm. you know? So th uh, the budget has done well in addressing these issues because I know Sabah and Sarawak very well that they do need all these facilities, they do need these budgets so that industrial estates could be upgraded, for example, the Samalaju mm -hmm. and also in Sabah. And uh, Samalaju, for example, in Sarawak is a favourite for many multinational companies because of the land availability, the size availability and all the services that is provided as a package for those investors who invest in those areas, like mm -hmm. a special electricity rate and so on because of the hydro uh, availability. Then, of course, connectivity has to be addressed because it cannot be just in Samalaju. And that is why the highways are being built, being planned to be built, so that uh, the people of Sarawak and Sabah, as well as investors who invest there, could be connected with Peninsula Malaysia and to the rest of the world, you know. Mm -hmm. So this, uh, I think uh, the budget has done well in addressing those issues besides upgrading the lives of the people of Sabah and Sarawak. So there's a social uh, issues that have been focused on and also in terms of upgrading of infrastructure and in attracting investments in into Malaysia. There's yeah. also exemptions yeah. for transport. Yeah, some really. some say no. Some say some people are saying that it is a politically motivated yeah. measures in the, the budget 2016. Uh, I I feel that it is it, it is being fair to them. Yeah. It's being fair to them because in terms of infrastructure, in terms of highway, we have the plus highway here. Yeah. They don't have the. You know, I travel to Sabah, and you know. Travelling from Tawau to Kota Kinabalu will take eight hours, you know. And, uh, you it's know, the run out road that yes, you use. The yeah. one and only These road. are necessities. Correct. Actually, and the road doesn't they have really sign. Mm. Yeah, you know, how many right. more kilometres to reach from yep. one point to the other? And I feel that we have to be fair to them mm -hmm. in terms of giving infrastructure and provision and, and to, to them to help them. Uh, so that will be yeah. equitable yeah. development between yeah. Peninsula and Sabah right. and Sarawak. Mm -hmm. I think it is good. Yeah. Education received the lion's share as it has in previous years, uh, but there are special allocations for Tibet, uh, yeah. which is something that will definitely drive much skill needed. training. It's mm -hmm. much needed, uh, but I'm very uh, uh, drawn to the allocation of 135 million for the improvement of the Malay language uh, and English. Uh, how do you see mm -hmm. these uh, two languages? Uh, you know, uh, how, how is the competency of both languages going to be increased with 135 million? Uh, that, uh, what's your opinion? Well, uh, I'm sure this is in an initial allocation because I also sit in the education board where we talked about this. 
definitely the focus on TVET is much needed because we need to produce skilled workforce to support all the uh, high-tech industries which are uh, coming in and being focused by Malaysia. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, but beside TVET, we also need language language proficiency. One is English and of course second is our national language. Mm. You know, you can't just master in foreign language without mastering our own language. Yeah, yeah? True. So therefore, but uh, therefore it goes hand in hand, like to upgrade your language skills, your own language and English, because English will support internalization of the students when they graduate. Mm -hmm. how, how would their employability be looked at by multinational companies who would invest in Malaysia, for example? Mm -hmm. So uh, it is a good thing that it has been focused at. But as I have uh, been sharing with the government in various forums, that while I support focus on TVET, we must not forget the soft skills development. This is where the language proficiency comes in. The soft mm -hmm. skills would be, uh, the, our students would have proficiency in business English, for example, and many other languages. Mm -hmm. So uh, other soft skills will be communication, skills to communicate with people, skill to express yourself, you know, how, how do you market yourself, how do you market the country. These are all the soft skills which are needed. And whether the Malaysian workforce could work independently, that is also a soft skills, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and ability to do research and development, uh, ability to innovate, these are the soft skills that will go hand in hand with TVET. Uh, will this require, I, I know both of you are not in the capacity to answer this question, but perhaps we could uh, get an opinion uh, from either one of you. Will this require a reworking or rethinking of the uh, national educational blueprint that's already out there? I think uh, I, I've not read in detail the National Education Blueprint, but I know the focus on TVET and soft skills is already there. I know, I think in 10 Malaysia plan, the soft skills has been addressed at, mm -hmm. and 11 Malaysia plan, of course, they are more focused about TVET, but soft skills has not been forgotten, you know, although it's not mentioned because it's already done in 10 Malaysia plan. Mm -hmm. So it is an ongoing, because I was involved in the budget 2016 with the Prime Minister during presentation, we did engage in this kind of dialogue whereby it has been focused in 10 Malaysia plan, which is carried forward in the 11 Malaysia plan. Mm. So I think the blueprint has addressed these issues. It's just the question of implementation, whether are they being the programs being implemented well or not, you know. So we leave it to, to the schools and Ministry of Education to, to ensure that it's it being implemented as planned. Yeah, uh, human capital is very important in terms of to become a developed nation. Mm -hmm. uh, so how do we increase the value of individuals, value of the raya? It is through education, it is through academic, through, through TVET and skills. Can, and, 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 and it has to be, uh, we have to increase the value of the individual. That, that's why I think there's a lot of uh, provision uh, for, for the education sector. Yeah. In leaving, uh, in attempting to not leave anyone behind, the budget also makes special mention of the Orang Asli, mm -hmm. uh, the community that uh, previously was not expressly mentioned by the budget but were considered to be a part of the allocation under Bumi Putra uh, and the various uh, allocations that go towards that community. Uh, so focusing on the Orang Asli in this budget, ma making special mention of them, oh, why do you think this is necessary, Dato? Definitely it is necessary because when we talk about the development of Malaysia moving into a developing, a developed country, while we are developing, we should not forget um, some quarters of the uh, social structure and community. So we did not forget Sabah and Sarawak as an area, but at the same time, we should not forget the people of Malaysia, and part of it is Orang Asli, mm. because they are the origin of, origin of this area. And I think all this while they have been somehow behind uh, in terms of development, in terms of education, in terms of income, exposure. So I think it's time that we focus on them and bring them upwards to be on par with yeah. the rest of the population of mm -hmm. Malaysia. Yeah, yeah. The, the theme for 11th Mission Plan is actually anchoring uh, growth on the people. 
meaning uh, orang asli is actually an untapped resources hmm. so we have this these people and then we can if we can educate give knowledge to them and give skill then they can contribute towards the economy Mm-hmm. That yeah. will be the source of skills. Yeah. 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 Uh, recently, uh, there was uh, an international uh, Aborigines art festival in Malaysia, mm. and uh, we had visitors from all around the world. The one thing they all share in common is they they have this responsibility. They they believe they have this responsibility to uphold uh, the way of life of their ancestors. Yeah. So they they feel this responsibility. But I think uh, we need to enhance. Uh, their own human potential yes, without yes. neglecting yeah. this responsibility right. that they shoulder. Yeah. Uh, a final word from each of my guests to just wrap up the budget and to sum it up, basically to to showcase uh, the salient points that you think are most pertinent from the budget. Maybe you can pick one or two and uh, elaborate just a little, just to close us off this evening. Uh, Tuan Haji, we'll start with you. Okay, uh, 2016 budget to to put it. To wrap it up, uh, I think it is a realistic budget uh, because based on the current economic situation and the current issue and financial position, fiscal position of the the, the country, and in terms of the uh, helping the people, helping the right yet at the same time um, not having problems with the the financial matters of the government. Uh, basically, I think it is a good budget, a realistic budget, and uh, inshallah, uh, we'll we'll try to achieve the twi- the balanced budget by 2020. Yeah. Uh, your well, in my opinion, ways. it's a very thoughtful budget, I would say. It's a balanced budget where every quarter of the economy has been addressed and those who were uh, slightly neglected in the previous budget are addressed at, for example, Sabah and Sarawak. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm also excited about the uh, vigorous way of addressing investments mm-hmm. in terms of upgrade of infrastructure that will attract um, uh, make Malaysia more attractive for investors and there's also enough allocation or good allocation to develop SMEs and all kinds of assistance are being offered to SMEs to develop one is to be vendors and suppliers to complete the supply chain but also for them to be upgraded to be a multinational companies themselves mm-hmm. and and they are also budget to assist Malaysian SMEs to export their products and services. So in time, if these are taken seriously by SMEs and by Malaysians uh, generally, Malaysia will reach a developed nation uh, as we target. Yeah? Thank you, Datuk, for joining Thank us. Uh, the chairman of uh, Crestone International, uh, Crestone International. And uh, also thank you to the president of the Malaysian Association of Tax Accountants, Don Haji Abdul Aziz, uh, for being here with us on the program. Uh, thank you for also tuning in. You can catch the repeat of the program uh, tomorrow, of course, on the 27th. And if you're watching this on the 27th, uh, make sure you continually catch our repeats on the MyClicks application uh, on RTM Mobile. This is going to be a challenging year end, uh, but moving forward, of course, we hope the budget will be the instrument to carry us through those challenges and weather whatever storms come our way. Uh, moving forward into 2016, the first quarter is expected to be choppy. Uh, looking at how maybe or maybe not the Fed will increase those interest rates, which may have an impact on our economy. But we look forward to an increase in the price of petroleum. We look forward to an increase uh, in the exchange rate of the ringgit to the dollar. All these uh, factors have actually uh, been dealt with in the earlier discussions, which will show an increase in income for Malaysia, which will definitely mean that we have more to spend. Thank you for tuning in, and uh, we hope that you've taken something away from this discussion. I'm Terence Das, and I look forward to hosting you in future programs. Good night, Malaysia, and stay safe.